Tracy, I, I, I want to shift gears to a very serious note. Obviously, you're out there in California, but you got the news like everybody else around here. Uh, the passing of Tom Browning. I mean, you go way, way back with Tom Browning. You remember the first time you were ever around him, first time you ever met him where you were? Well, Tom and I, have I've known Tom for probably 40 years, and I've got to tell you that that one yesterday when I got a call from Scott Sloan of 700 WLW, <clears throat> excuse me, and he said, you know, Tom Browning passed away. It, it really, I had a rough day yesterday. I, I will tell you this. The first game that I ever played in the minors was when Tom Browning was the opening night pitcher with the Tampa Tarpons in a ball. And Tom was pitching. We were playing against St. Pete Cardinals. And Tom was the pitcher, and I was playing third base. The score, Tom pitched all nine innings. The score we won, I think, seven to four. Tom gave up four runs. Here's the catch on this. They were all four unearned runs. I was playing third base. I made three errors. So if I hadn't made those three errors, and this is the honest to God truth, and Tom never said anything when we were playing, but afterwards, every time I would see him, he would bring that up. He would have pitched a complete game shutout. So that was three errors, honest to God, no exaggeration, and Tom was just masterful. I think he gave up two hits. Uh, you know how fast he worked, right? Yeah. So it was a fast game. And I, I just, I, I'm going to miss Tom because I would go to his bar and have a couple of cocktails with him. We'd talk about former players. He didn't, Tom was from Wyoming. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah. And he really didn't like guys from California. There were a couple guys that he played with in the minors that he didn't like, and they were from California. He says, you know, you California people are a little different. He liked me. We got along. He liked Eric Davis and stuff. But there were a couple of guys that he played with in California. One guy actually was a shortstop that I played with in college, Vinny Rover. And Vinny made a couple of errors in a game in uh, just spring training. And Tom Browning got on him. He didn't get on me when I made three errors, but he got on Vinny Rover. And Vinny Rover walked up to him. He says, if you say one more thing, he says, I'm going to break that golden left arm of yours. <laughs> and I got in between them, broke it up. They were ready to go to blows. And Tom always brings that, brought those stories stories up about Vinny Rover and not liking that guy too much, but what a hell of a pitcher. You know, um, you, you hear, and, and look, you were around him forever. I, I've been around him, uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds of times. He just, he, he treated everybody, I thought, maybe except for uh, Vinny, uh, but he, he just <laughs> treated people, you know, so well. It didn't matter who you are, what your plight was in life. Uh, whether, you know, you were on top of the mountain or, or scurrying around down the bottom of the ocean. Uh, he always had a smile and, and, and just he was always just fun to be around and a kind, easygoing guy. But 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 that that certainly was not reflective once he took the ball and stepped on the mound. Right. No, he was a totally different guy once. And a lot of pitchers are like that. We talked about Jack Morris. We talked about Randy Johnson being a different when they're pitching. But Tommy would get on you if he was pitching and you didn't hustle. He didn't like that. You make an error, that's all right. You not hustling for a ball, that's a problem. We were playing against Houston at uh, Riverfront. And Glenn Davis, you remember Glenn Davis, Tom, sure. right? Yeah. First baseman, good hitter. He hits one down the third base line. Cal's playing left. I'm playing center. And Cal jogs to get the ball, right? Glenn Davis, who couldn't run a lick, ends up at third base. So Cal comes back to the dugout, and Tom meets him right at the, the edge of the dugout and says, what the hell was that, Cal? Run after the damn ball. And Cal looked at, at, looked at Tom and said, I didn't throw it. And that mm. was that. But he didn't like it when you loafed. You know, uh, Tracy, we had Paul Dockerty on earlier. And, and, and look, you've been in the area uh, ever since your playing career came to the end. You've made this your home. Tom Browning did the same thing. Uh, you mentioned from Cody, Wyoming. This became his full-time home. Look, this guy, uh, uh, like a lot of us, you know, had his ups and downs. Uh, and life was certainly not easy 
uh, for this guy uh, in the last number of years, and especially for his kids, and now raising his grandkids. Um, yes. You know, when you would visit with him, had you been worried about him for a while? I think it's safe to say there were a lot of people that have been worried about him for a while. No, I really wasn't worried about Tom. I, I thought he was all right. I knew he had diabetes. I knew that he was taking care of his grandkids, right? He right. stubbed his toe or hit his toe on one of the grandkids' toys. Is this? And he didn't take care of it because the diabetic ended up having to have his toe amputated. And I thought that really was kind of like he started to go downhill a little bit. The last couple of times I saw him, but I thought Tom was doing all right. People, people love Tom Browning. So when he went out and sometimes I was out with him, he got a lot of attention. Yeah, he, um, he, everybody loved the guy. In fact, my dad, you know, was telling me last night on the phone um, that he was with him two days ago uh, at an event. Oh, really? And, and said that he had looked better, uh, at least my dad thought, that he had looked better than he had at any point in time in the last couple of years. He had finally gained some weight after losing a bunch of weight. Uh, he had he had good color to his skin, uh, and appeared to be doing very very well. This guy did anything the Reds asked him to do. I mean anything, and and just loved doing it. Uh, it it was really kind of crazy. I mean you go with people, and I'd been with Tom a couple of times, and everybody calls him Mister Perfect. First of all, it's tough for me to call him Tom. I called him Puggy. Do you know where yeah. I got that yeah. nickname from? Yeah. You know, that's Pete's nickname that he gave him, Puggy. Really? I didn't that know that. Puggy. Tell me that story. How yeah. did he get that story? Yeah. yeah, Pete never called him Tom or never called him. He might call him. He didn't call him Bulldog or anything. That was Puggy. And that's, and he would say that all the time. And he, Tom, Pete Rose was a huge fan of Tom Browning because you love Tom. He was a gamer. Tom, there was one game, and maybe you were broadcasting it. Do you remember the game in Candlestick Park? When he was hitting, yeah, I was hit going to tell that days. story. Yeah, I was going to tell that story later. Yes, indeed. Remember, remember when he got hit in the eye? Yep. And it started to bleed, and his eye started to swell up. So you think he's coming out of the game? So he comes back to the dugout. We're ready to, you know, send another pitcher out there. They said, "Hey, I'm fine." And Larry Starr, the trainer, put a butterfly, yep, over there to stop the bleeding. That son of a gun went out there and finished his at bat. Do I have that story right? That was a long time. You, you ago. know what? It's funny, but because um, uh, I was not doing the game, I think that would have been probably around what eighty six, eighty seven, something like that. Eighty seven. Okay, 87. yeah, I wasn't doing the games yet. I heard that story through Bob Bremley, who was a longtime yeah. catcher for the Giants, uh, All Star, my former partner for many, many years, both at Fox and the Diamondbacks and the Cubs. But he was the catcher in that game when it happened. And he told me that story. He said, man, I, he said, of all the things I've seen, and he said, I've seen some crazy stuff. You hang around baseball or yeah. life long enough. He said, this dude splits his, like you said, his eye open. It's bleeding all yes. over the place. You're thinking he's going to have to come out of the game. He said, the next thing you know, they're stitching this thing, butterflying this thing, whatever they're doing. And, and the guy walks up. And there he is. He said, and I get down to crouch in the batter's box, and I just looked at him and said, man, you are a gamer. And as you know, from one player to another, when you hear that from an opposing player, that's as high a compliment as you're going to get. He took pride in that. You know, the, the old nickname, the Bulldog, all that stuff. He's got all those nicknames. But people love Tom Browning. And I'll tell you, I don't know if you've touched on this, Tom. Remember he had that special pitch that no one throws anymore, right? Yep. The screwball. Yep. Uh, and he had great arm action. I don't know whatever happened to the screwball. You know, one pitch that I could not hit, well, there's many pitches I couldn't hit, but the screwball was my toughest. You know, whether it was Fernando, I faced Tom Browning, his screwball was nasty, and that was his pitch. And I think really the success of Tom was working really fast. And his players, all, his position players always play good defense because you knew he was getting the ball and, and throwing it, getting it and throwing it. I mean, he'd pitch games right there every game, probably right around 210, wouldn't you say? I mean, it yeah, was a yeah, yeah, fast, yeah, fast yeah, yeah. I mean, he is, he is, he, I mean, I, I, that, that's a guy you take video of and you show it to every single young pitcher that's out there right now because your defense – not your game in the minor leagues in Tampa, notwithstanding against St. Pete. But your defense right. is ready to play. And more times than not, 
when they're not getting bored. You know, it, it's like that, that thing about, you know, baseball and kids. When you start playing slow or you start walking guys or you're taking a long time in between pitches, you know, now Major League Baseball players don't have dandelions growing out in the outfield like they do in Little League parks or not whole parks. But, but I would imagine that, that playing behind a guy like Browning, you couldn't let yourself do anything but stay completely laser focused while you're out there on defense. You, you did. You knew it was going to be a quick game and we could get out, especially if we're on the road and go to those strip bars that I like to frequent. And so did Tom, to be quite honest with you, but that's a whole different story. But yeah, he worked fast. And, you know, Tom, he was a guy who was out of Wyoming, like you said. I, I forget what college he went to. He wasn't a high draft pick. He was uh, at he some was a low tiny dra- little school in Tennessee, like Tennessee yeah. Christian or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what a great, what a great career. You know, he only had one losing season. Yeah, I mean, you look good. at some of his numbers. And he, but, but you know what's funny, Tracy, is, and I was going to ask Chris Welsh about this, and we had some technical issues with him today. But um, he went to, uh, let's see, Tennessee Wesleyan University. <laughs> Tennessee yes. Wesleyan. Um, and a low draft pick. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, but this is the question I was going to ask you because you went through this with your son, although Hunter was not a pitcher. Um, Let's see. Tom Browning was drafted. He started at uh, Lemoyne College in Syracuse, was there for three years. Then he goes to Tennessee Wesleyan College in Athens, Tennessee, and was a ninth round pick they stuck him in the pioneer league and if you can believe Billings. this he led the pioneer league in innings pitch which is not a surprise but led the pioneer league in strikeouts then they send him to the fall instructional league and in 78 innings he punches out 101 and goes eight and one for that tampa team you were talking about going back to uh 1983 but here, here's the question i was going to ask you this is, again tracy we get into topics about baseball and why I mm-hmm. have so many issues with baseball on multiple levels now. Because Chris Welsh did go through this with his son, who within the last couple of years was a pitcher at the University of Louisville. He was a guy that did not throw more than 89 miles an hour. Okay? You know and I know, because you took your son Tucker to all these showcase events. When he's this highly recruited high school player, eventually gets drafted by the Cleveland Indians. You know as well as I do, you're a left-hander that shows up throwing 85, 87, 88, 89 miles an hour. They're not even watching you throw five pitches anymore, the scouts in baseball today. Tom Browning would not be drafted today. I don't, I don't think Tom Browning hit 90 miles an hour, Tom. I could be wrong. But he's exactly the guy that would not get drafted. But saying all that, he was on the fast track. Someone from the Reds liked him because, remember, they had the great scouts there. And he was pushed through the system. That time I played with, uh, with Tom in Tampa, he only pitched a few games. I mean, he was out of there and on his way to double A. He was on the fast track. So here's the deal with those type of pitchers. They'll give you a shot, maybe, but you better produce. Because if you don't produce, they'll release you. You know, a guy like Greg Maddox didn't throw hard. And do you ever see highlights of Greg Maddox back in A-ball? I mean, he was not a hard thrower, but he had really good numbers coming through the minors. So you just can't – they won't give you a second shot. They won't stay with you. Well, I mean, I mean, you boy, you hit the nail on the head. You got a great memory, Tracy. I give it up to you. I mean, this is going back to 1983, and for you to remember all this like it's clockwork, and you're spot on. So he was with that Tampa team that you were talking about in 83. He's only there for half the season. They send him to Double A, where he throws another yes. 117 innings. The next year, he starts a year at Triple A. Okay, wins 12 games, leads the league in strikeouts. In July of that year, they bring him to the major leagues. So he was in eight ball half a year, or Pioneer League. Okay, now that's low-level rookie. So Very it's the next year at single A. He's there a half year, finishes a year at double A half year. Starts the next year at triple A half year in the big leagues. In his major league debut, he beat Oral Harshizer and the Dodgers. 
goes eight and a third innings in his major league debut, and he gives up one run. The next year, his first year, full year in the major <laughs> leagues, he wins 20 games. First rookie to win 20 games going back to 1954. But I Here's still the thing with Tracy, he doesn't get – I'm with you, he doesn't no. get drafted. And here's the other part. Okay, I keep getting back, and it's not to bash baseball because we're talking about Tom Browning here. But there's no way you're seeing a pitcher that year with you in a ball. In a half year, well, he throws 78 innings. In the second half of that year, he throws 117 innings. So this cat throws well over 200 innings. His first year of professional baseball. You're lucky to find a major league pitcher who throws 200 innings now. He didn't want to come out of the game. He wanted to finish the game. He didn't want to turn it over. He was, Tom Browning was just the opposite of a pitcher who was a five and dive guy. You know, like, like a Scott Scant Sanderson. I mean, Tom, you know that name. I mean, you give me five innings and I'm out there. If I have the lead, Tom was exactly the opposite. Puggy wanted to finish the game. And what catches me off guard, and I didn't know this, and you've brought it up a couple of times, is the strikeouts. Yeah. I didn't know he struck that many guys out. On what pitch was that? Because he really didn't have a curveball. I mean, I think, and I keep thinking it was just fastball and a screwball. I could be wrong. I know he had another pitch. But those are the only two pitches I remember him throwing and working fast and throwing strikes, and he could spot the ball. Do you have any idea, and, and maybe you don't, um, was he throwing? He had to have been to, to, to have that kind of success so young in his career. So he must have been throwing the screwball long before he became a professional pitcher, right? I think so. And I, I'm starting to think that his changeup was kind of that screwball. Because remember, he had real, I mean, as a hitter, I'm always breaking down pitchers. And I think he had such good arm action, fast arm action, and then he would turn it over a little bit. And like I said, it's, it only, it takes velocity off the pitch, but it also has movement down and away to a right-handed hitter. Uh, he was very difficult. And he had a, again, I'm giving you a scouting report on Tom Browning because I had to face him, a very good move to first base. He was, he could fill his position. He could bunt. If you had a pitcher that needed to put down a bunt, he could do all the little things. A lot of Reds players back in then could do it all. And, and Tom Browning was a pitcher that could hit a little bit, but he'd put down that bunt every single time. And if he didn't, he'd be very disappointed in himself. Um, you know, we just got so many incredible uh, points being made by so many and, and, and remembering, um, you know, Tom Browning and, and – uh, you know, um, you, you, Tracy, you knew Joe Nuxall. We were talking with Paul Doherty about this earlier. You knew Sean Casey. I mean, you know both of those. Yep. You knew Joe, and you still know Sean and that kind of thing. Yep. What, what, what was it, do you think, that, uh, that made Tom Browning so popular with just the regular fans out there? Did, did he do something different he... than a lot of other guys if you were giving him advice? you would say you ought to be more like Tom Browning in what way? Because he's easygoing. He's approachable. I'll give you another nickname that he went by was Otis. Remember Otis from the Andy yeah. Griffiths? I'm just telling you that and everybody liked Otis, right? How can you not like Otis? And that's sometimes, you know, Pete would refer to him as Otis. Uh, he just had an easy way about him. He had that presence, but yet he was approachable. And he would sit down there, and and like I said, we go to the bar, and we would sit down and tie one on there for a little, and have a couple of cocktails and just tell stories. He's a great storyteller as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I, I just think he had, he just had some tough times, and I, I think he had a lot of responsibility with his kids, his grandkids, and uh, I just feel bad. I, I I do feel bad. I mean, being with someone and knowing him for almost forty years, that's kind of tough.